Uh, thank you very much. Uh, interesting. So now we're going to be moving to uh, Fireside Chat, uh, looking at the asset management equity trading desk and portfolio management merge. Uh, again, Jay Wilson, I'm the moderator, uh, research director here at Chartist, and I'm with Frank Laughlin, global co-head of equity trading at Alliance Bernstein. Uh, Frank, thanks very much for joining today. Uh, maybe just a, a little introduction of yourself and, um, and again, your continuing uh, escalating role at Alliance Bernstein. Sure, thanks, Jay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, second, uh, my name is Frank Lachlan. Uh, I oversee equity trading globally at Alliance Bernstein, as Jay mentioned. Uh, our team operates from London, Sydney, Hong Kong, Taipei, Shanghai, and Nashville, Tennessee, uh, which is where I'm joining you from today. Uh, I've been at the firm for a little over 30 years and held a variety of um, roles within equities, primarily within equity trading, um, the bulk of which was in some form managing, you know, U.S. and America's trading or global trading. Uh, which is what I've done for most of the last 20 something odd years. So let's condense that a little, Frank. Uh, sure. So within the last five years, or, or, you know, bring it back, what are some of the most significant changes that you've seen? I mean, obviously, is it algos? Is it TCA? Is it, you know, speed of investing? Um, what What's maybe some of the major changes that you've seen on the on the desk or your multiple desks sure so uh what we would say is as the as the equity trading world has become more automated right and 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 thus faster but but certainly more automated we are continually asked to do more with less and to rely more on automation and technology right so um regardless of strong market environment or weak market environment strong business environment uh, or, or challenging business environment, you know, our resourcing over time has gotten much leaner, you know, from a human capital and talent standpoint. Um, and so we're, we're continually asked to do the same or more with fewer people, right? Which uh, necessitates a reliance on innovation automation. Um, you know, processes. Uh, at the same time, we also, right, interestingly enough, um, it seems we certainly are, and it seems that a lot of the buy side um, externally is trying to do more with fewer, right, meaning um, we're seeing an environment where trading partnerships are concentrated, um, you know, we seem, to, we seem to be in an environment that's really barbelled between, at one end, size and scale wins big, um, at the, and at the other end, you know, you have, um, you know, this kind of very specific um, but very powerful capability around, you know, uh, automation, speed, market microstructure expertise, right? But, you know, you have firms at the top, right, kind of large global banks um, that by virtue of size and scale and balance sheet um, are able to be massive providers of liquidity at the one end. And at the other end, you have firms that perhaps you'd characterize them as intermediaries or market makers who have a very specific skill and whose business is not necessarily nearly scaled, nearly scaled the way a large global bank is, but who nonetheless are valuable trading partners. Um, and then the last thing that's changed over time, um, you know, and kind of on the heels of, of your la of the last pre-recorded session, um, as data has become more abundant and more prevalent, there's more of an expectation um, you know, that we avail ourselves of it and, and use it in what we do. Yeah, no, it's like, so, so look, obviously don't divulge anything you, you don't want to, and I know you won't, but though, um, that, um, what would say your split is between high touch and low touch? Um, is there any way no, you could kind of give us like a little percentage and maybe, you know, uh, geographically sure. you handle global, right? So, we do right so so so, so it, on an aggregate basis it's probably 90 10 globally low touch to high touch um there's some regional nuance there but probably not as much as you would expect um and 
Look, I think that, uh, again, going to the point about size and scale of the global banks, a significant portion of, and again, we don't believe we're alone here, a significant portion of what we do high touch, right, involves some engagement around blocks and liquidity provisioning, often through risk and use of balance sheet, right? In other words, what, what has died over time, certainly, you know, and I've been around longer than most, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, what has died over time is the notion of the working order, right? Like it just sort of doesn't exist kind of that human, like, Hey, I'll keep an eye on it. I'll watch it. I'll work it for you better than somebody else. Um, in hindsight is almost laughable. No offense to right to, um, you know, to, to do that. It just kind of, um, you know, there, there's, there's two in our thought, in our minds, there's two broad ways to, to approach an order, one is kind of automated and systematic, and the other is one that looks for, you know, certainty and immediacy, and that often involves um, liquidity provisioning through risk. So you said 90, 10, around 90 percent being low, low touch and 10 percent being high. Yes. Wow, that that is in, really incredible. Uh, but though, so so basically, are there any clients that say, "Look, Frank, I want your desk to handle this and and view it." Is it is it always just size, or is well, it other so, so, conditions? No, so I, I I would say, look, I, I would um, let's let's not make the the assumption or the mistake that trading something low touch takes the trader out of it, right? Because uh, we would argue vehemently that it doesn't, right? Um, the trader is often the one choosing the strategy, um, the, right? The, it, it's really just, it's an issue of how you mechanically enter the market, but you can exert, to a large extent, you can exert the same level of control over picking spots and picking levels, right? And how you trade an order as a buy side trader using a low touch channel as you can over a high touch channel. Um, in fact, we might argue more so, right? Um, Whereas, in, you know, on a high touch channel, if you're not trading blocks and you are leaving it with somebody, you're probably leaving it more to their discretion than yours. But we view, right, either channel, right, or any channel, right, we'll, we'll include PT in that. We view those channels as an extension of us, right? Like at the end of the day, we're the ones selecting the strategy, picking the firm with whom we're going to partner, right? So the, the way the order is traded should reflect exactly how we, Alliance Bernstein, equity traders want it to be traded, it shouldn't be anybody else's choice. Um, so I would I would not confuse workflow automation with taking the trader out of the process. Yeah, totally understand. And just a real, again, do uh, you use any outsource trading? We do not, absolutely not. We don't, no, very good, very good. And and the, the traders on the desk, would you say that um, uh, your, your high touch traders, is that, are they specialized only in that, or now are they forced? Uh, no, to, no, to do no. Both? The, the, so our coverage model is by sector and industry in the U.S. and by country outside, and it's seamless. So, for example, right, the the uh, you know our trader in Asia who trades Japan, um, you know she trades Japan across high and low touch, right? The trader in the U.S. who trades tech, he trades tech across high and low touch, right? So um, we don't have people who specialize. Look, at the end of the day. You know, the, the one thing that's probably changed a bit in terms of the buy side, sell side dynamic around high touch trading is that if as a buy side trader, you're going to be a user of risk and risk pricing, right, as a means of, of um, availing yourselves of liquidity, you have to have a pretty good sense of, of understanding risk pricing, right? Like if we're going to ask somebody for a price on a particular piece of merchandise, regardless of the size, in order to vet whether the price that um, we see is um, is a quality price, right? Um, we have to have our own understanding of what we think risk should cost, right? And, you know, of course, certainty and immediacy and risk transfer as a mechanism costs something, right? And, and everyone's well aware of that. Um, but you need to be aligned on what you think the appropriate cost is, right, both in terms of communicating it to the investors, the portfolio manager and their team, as well as, you know, vetting with whoever you ask to provide that price, 
whether or not it's a price, right? And we don't view for, you know, for what it's worth, we don't view risk trading kind of as a zero sum game. Somebody wins, somebody loses at the point of engagement. Um, we are firm believers, right, that um, a risk trade can be a positive outcome for both sides, meaning the provider of risk, right, um, can turn that P&L into a P, right? Um, and the, the risk transfer premium that we pay is worthwhile for our investors and clients because immediacy and certainty and the ability to realize the proceeds of a sale right away and put them into a better idea have value, right, beyond, um, you know, just the premium that you pay for risk transfer. Yeah, uh, so so within some of your pre-trade price analytics, valuation analytics, is that tied in with your EMS or is it kind of like separate modules? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's a model we use, right? It's available through the EMS, but yeah, there, there's we use a variety of different models um, as means of of estimating what we think the cost of a trade should be, right? And using that as a a basis for modeling risk trades you know when we engage in them so you know again it's just down at the, the fixed income uh, conference in nashville i uh, heard some great music at the hard rock cafe but uh, we won't go there um that uh, Fun that, town. That, you know <laughs> right exactly um so, so so basically though you know there's a lot of interaction on credit fixed income traders with the portfolio manager, you know, like looking at equal risk possible uh, suitability. Uh, I'm sure there's a huge amount of interaction with your portfolio managers, but maybe just uh, this, describe is, is that more of an uptick or has it always been there? For us, it's, for, for us, it's always been there, right? I think one of the things we've always been very cognizant of is our role as traders, right? We are trading to optimize portfolio performance and client outcomes, right? So our job as traders is not to beat benchmarks. My job as somebody who oversees traders is not to construct a team that beats benchmarks, right? Our job is to implement the wishes, right? And the desires of the portfolio managers as efficiently and effectively as possible, um, which is not to say we shy away from measurement, right? But but we need to be clear on, on what the objectives are. And so we've always had a close relationship with the portfolio teams and the portfolio managers we trade for. Um, because if you're gonna try and optimize their decisions for them, right, in the in, in, through the implementation process, through the trade execution process, you need to have a, a solid understanding of how they manage their portfolios, how they construct their portfolios, their investment process, the prism through which they view the world, right? And so that's always been a, a tight alignment um, for us at AB, um, and we just, you know, I think everybody's staying on their side of the line, meaning, right, the portfolio manager's own stock selection and portfolio construction and the timing of sending orders to the desk, um, and the trader's own largely execution strategy and liquidity management and the decision as to the best form to trade, right? You kind of, you know, start off with the question before about, clients or portfolio managers having, having input, um, you, you know, in, in into the way we trade something. Certainly, right, again, it's their portfolio, it's their performance. So if they want to put limits on orders or, you know, size their orders differently as they send them down, not send the whole order, that's their prerogative. What's not their prerogative is broker selection, channel selection between high touch, low touch, and PT, right, and anything that's an offshoot of that. Um, and so again, we're just the, the alignment's tight, but everybody stays on their side of the line. Yeah, plays their position uh, and yeah, contributes to that return on the portfolio. Um, a, w once again, Frank, this has been great. Thank you very much uh, for oh, it was your a pleasure, your Jay. Insight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having me. Cheers.